first up, um, we've got Kate Harries, and she will tell you about how NABLEC is going, at least from initial surveys. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, so the, this presentation describes uh, recent work piecing together results of surveys over time to help understand changes that have occurred in rehabilitated areas of a legacy mine, um, which as you know, is the former Nabalek uranium mine. But for those who don't know, um, it's within the Alligator Rivers region that includes Ranger Mine within Kakadu National Park. Um, Narbalek is uh, west of Ranger within Arnhem Land, and um, we must acknowledge permission from Narbalek traditional owners for research on their land. Uh, we also pay our respects to the traditional owners of the Darwin and Brisbane regions where we conduct research and monitoring and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. Um, so Narbalek, uh, the ore body was dug out in one dry season uh, in 1979 and stockpiled and milled through the 1980s. Uh, rehabilitation works were completed approximately 25 years ago. Um, and it was one of the first mines in Australia to have a formal rehabilitation plan. Um, it has a lot also, I mean, it has a lot of similarities to Ranger. So that photo was taken last week on the right, and that's from the 1980s during operation. Okay, um, the disturbed areas that were rehabilitated can be broadly described according to their use during operations. So three main types of areas. So mine areas that are on this uh, slide are in red, are the former mine pit and the dump of waste rock that was beside it. Um, pond areas in blue, dugout areas that stored uh, mined waters, including two large evaporation ponds, called, they were called EP1 and EP2. Um, that were needed to evaporate off excess waters from runoff ponds. Um, and then the yellow shows other disturbed areas, which is generally where the ground surface was left intact. And this includes the storage area for uh, topsoil and clay. And the forest, there was a irrigation areas where uh, even excess water was uh, during the 1980s irrigated over areas of woodland, the forest irrigation area. Um, and that caused the death of some large trees. So that trial was very quickly ceased. Um, so the broad rehabilitation goals were to return self-sustaining natural ecosystems that blend with the surrounding woodlands. Um, these local woodlands are in a broad sense, either dry eucalypt woodlands or areas of Melaleuca dominated uh, seasonally inundated areas that I'm going to refer to as riparian areas. Um, just briefly, rehabilitation actions, filling the voids with waste rock, surface ripping, topsoil spread, um, use of a native seed mix, which they developed to match um, geological variation in the vegetation. Um, there, it was just trees and shrubs, no understory. Um, then there was, there has been some later work, um, including reseeding, um, planting tube stock. And there was, uh, for a time, um, a weed and fire management um, program, which, in, which combined fire and herbicides. Um, now, so to try to get an, uh, just an initial idea um, of whether these rehabilitated areas at 25 years are on a trajectory towards that goal of self-sustaining woodlands similar to surrounds, um, I've drawn data that's available for NABLEX. So initially historical surveys, um, Mainly um, the data comes from the baseline survey in 1979 and the, there was an early survey of the, the early stage of the rehabilitation works. Um, and then in 2003, our supervising scientists established some transects on the site. Uh, so eight years into rehabilitation and these were really clearly marked out. So uh, we were able to resurvey survey them last year. So around approximately 25 years. Um, I haven't got much time, but I'm just going to present um, a couple of uh, 
indicators of the, you know, towards that question of whether we're getting similarity and sustainability. Uh, these are all relating to vegetation. Um, and then just a couple of environmental parameters that I found, which um, might be some drivers of the patterns that we're seeing. Okay. Um, first in um, species diversity, these box plots um, show the variation in native species per 100 meter squared quadrat. I was able to do this because all of these surveys actually use the same quadrat size. Um, found in the monitoring, these were the ones, but these particular ones were found in the monitoring transects eight years after rehabilitation, but there's also mean values for the same area um, from the baseline study, so from pre-mining. Um, so this suggests that the riparian and dry woodlands that were included as the reference areas for the monitoring transects had similar species richness to that found in similar areas pre-mining in 1979. Um, at eight years, you can see all the rehabilitated areas had on average less than half the native species richness of reference areas, um, with the pond areas having a lower diversity than the mine areas. So that's last year, uh, resurveying the same, the same transects. Um, so you can see the reference areas were similar. Um, the waste rock dump, which is orange, uh, had gained a few species on average. The pit, red, had become more variable in terms of numbers of native species. And the pond areas both seem to have lost species over the intervening 17 years. Um, last year, we added additional transects to look at those other less impacted areas. Um, and you can see they're much closer or even equivalent to the uh, reference areas. Uh, this graph shows uh, species uh, composition in the different times the monitoring transects were surveyed, the open shapes from the eight year survey and the field shapes from the 25 year survey. So um, broadly, uh, for those who don't are not familiar with these, um, the closer the, the, the transect um, symbols are together, the closer their species composition and broadly the further they are along the x-axis, the closer in composition they are to the natural reference uh, woodland transects. So this suggests uh, some rehabilitated areas of the waste drop dump, that's orange again, and former mine pit, red, have become more similar to the natural woodlands. However, areas of the ponds, the blue, have not changed much in composition over that time. Adding in those extra areas that we looked at last year, um, where the surface was left relatively intact, the forest irrigation area and the stockpile storage area, this graph indicates that these areas are closer in composition to the surrounding woodlands than the other areas. Um, generally, the changes over time relate to changes in the ground layer. Um, so um, this analysis highlights species most responsible for the changes over time in species composition patterns shown in the previous graph. Um, and basically, it suggests that uh, a reduction in weed species, those are the ones in red, um, is most responsible for changes that occurred over time in the monitoring transects. Um, some of these, like passiflora and paragrass, were specifically targeted by um, that combined fireweed control effort in the mid 2000s. Um, another pattern over time in the understory in these transects is there's been an increase in the abundance of native grasses, um, and particularly in the former waste rock dump and pit. Um, so this graph shows some trends in stem density in different trees and shrubs from combining the data from various historical sources. Um, the solid lines show trends in rehabilitated areas and the dotted lines are average stem densities for the same plant type um, that have been found in reference a native woodland. This graph is just for, I've got no sound. Um, this graph is just for rehabilitated uh, mine areas, so the pit and the waste rock dump. I think I've got no microphone. Is that better? Yeah, just too far away. Um, yeah, so here we go. Just briefly, so the grey um, initial dense stands of acacia in these areas decreased over time to 
uh, average uh, densities in the reference woodland. Um, there was a gradual increase from this exercise, it seems, in eucalypt density after an initial loss of stems. However, at 25 years, um, the density of eucalypts is still well below the average density in eucalypts in reference woodlands. The yellow line uh, shows values for other trees um, and shrubs like Buccanania, Ficus, Terminalia that occur in the dry woodlands surrounding the mine. And many of these are fauna distributed. They're also important food plants for traditional owners. Um, so the trend in rehabilitated mine areas seems to have been for these to increase, particularly in the last 15 years. And what's interesting is that quite a few of these were not in the original seed mix. Um, so that's the graph for the pond areas. Um, so it suggests uh, stem density may have decreased over time within pond areas for all types, including Melaleuca. This, the dotted lines there are for the riparian reference. Um, so that question of sustainability, whether it's becoming a self-sustaining woodland, um, this graph shows the average number of seedlings less than 10 centimetres, the top one, and juvenile woodland trees less than one metre, that's the bottom one, bottom graph, that were found in the rehabilitated, rehabilitated areas and reference woodlands within the transects. So they were the same transects at eight and 25 years. Um, now you can see, so well, but the ones at the end were obviously just last year. And in fact, the FIA is the only place uh, where we have where anyone has found similar levels of recruitment to reference dry woodland transects. Um, so generally we can say very few seedlings or juvenile trees have been found in the Narble Lake monitoring transects. There are, there is some recruitment, but not within those transects, but generally it's suggesting that it's quite low. Um, don't worry about the detail. Um, this graph uh, shows species composition patterns from the most recent transect survey last year with an overlay of patterns in environmental parameters that were measured in the transects at the same time. And just broadly, um, there is a trend of lower soil hardness, lower soil nutrients, and a higher fire frequency in transects with a species composition closer to the composition in the natural reference areas. Um, generally, when um, we look at patterns in soil parameters that have been measured in similar areas over time at Narbalek, there is a pattern of increases in soil nutrients over time. Um, so that graph shows percentage of nitrogen that was found in similar parts of the mine um, and surrounding natural woodlands immediately after initial rehabilitation works compared to what we found in the same parts of the mine site last year. So this suggests that soil nitrogen has increased in the waste rock dump pit and especially in uh, areas of former ponds that contain mine waters. Um, there may be an association between levels of increases in nitrogen and other nutrients and the biomass of weed grasses in rehabilitated areas. Um, the pond areas in particular uh, were densely covered, that's the two th uh, graph from 2003. Um, and at that time, the ponds were already uh, pretty densely covered by mission grass, para and feather top roads grass. And this cover is, there's still high weed cover there. Um, however, um, para grass has definitely decreased. We didn't find that in transects this time. Uh, one surprising trend um, suggested from comparing soil surveys over time is that the organic soil carbon in the rehabilitated areas has increased substantially um, relative to levels in the surrounding natural woodlands, um, particularly on areas of the former ponds. Um, those are some photos that we took last week. Um, that's in EP1 and the riparian reference area. Um, so you can see the difference in grass biomass on the former pond area, which is dominated by annual mission grass and feather top roads grass, compared to the grass biomass in the mixed natives understory in the natural woodland. Um, the sweet grass no, either dies back or it burns and rots as the pond areas are inundated in the wet season. Um, and both of those processes might have contributed to an increase in soil carbon over time. So um, in summary, there are a couple of trends that can be drawn from comparing changes in available measured plant and environmental parameters over time at Narbalek that I've presented here. Um, 
So firstly, there, there is some evidence of a trajectory towards the reference natural woodlands in the areas of the pit and the waste rock dump. However, at 25 years, diversity, composition and structure are not yet highly similar to the surrounding woodlands. Um, also, recruitment levels of woodland trees in rehabilitated areas appears to be low, uh, which may impact future sustainability of the established plant communities. Um, the deviated trajectory in the ponds highlights the importance of the initial substrate. Um, these areas were both highly compacted during operations and the compaction in filled in areas may have increased as they're repeatedly inundated during each wet season. Um, might be some evidence um, in terms of the improvement in the understory that um, weed management at the site and, and perhaps the history of high fire frequency has had some impact on, on reducing weeds and increasing abundance of some native um, understory grasses. Um, that pattern in those other plants coming in probably uh, is suggesting that supplementary plantings or other fauna habitat enhancements may be important for encouraging faunal distributed plants uh, like Macanania, which are also the important traditional food plants that have been identified for Nabalek. Um, finally, high soil carbon and soil nutrients on rehabilitated sites with naturally low nutrient soil, such as occurs at Nabalek, may indicate a deviated trajectory with an understory dominated by weed grasses. Um, so this was an initial exercise. I'm just only in the initial stages of my PhD on um, applying the trajectory um, concept to Nabalek. Um, and I just, I need to acknowledge extensive support from supervising scientists um, and traditional owners um, commission facilitated by the Northern Land Council and also DevEx who are the mine lease holder who um, also facilitated site access and understanding of ongoing site practices. Um, that's all, thank you. So, uh, welcome to open the floor. Too many quick questions. Okay. Daryl, well, from what I've measured, it's not that different to the, the pH isn't really seems to be that different. So what is, what is your guess why the organic matter is not decomposed that quickly compared to reference sites? Um, I just think it's a, just, just look at the difference in biomass that every year is getting put into that site. Some, I mean, the water logging is probably part of it. Yeah, a big part of it. Probably need to come and talk to you <laughs> back at the SMI, get your ideas. Yeah. Anyone else? Yep. Catherine, that was really great. Thanks. Oh, thank I, you. Um, so if you, so the gaps between the reference and the site are really substantial. So if you yeah. had to design or think about uh, um, some kind of experiment where you might test what management actions yeah. would, would get us closer. What, what, what oh, I'd love suggest? to look at fire. I'd love to look at the impact of, of fire, like fire and like, you know, get someone like Christo out there again and look at the impact of that, that targeted, you know, management of combining fire and weed management. Yeah, yeah that would be really interesting. Yeah, okay. and I think highly relevant to planning for other mines. So do you think then the nutrients is, is more, um, you know, with the soil disturbance thing that nutrients might be, be playing more of a factor than compaction capacity? I think it's both. Yeah, yeah I think it's both. Yeah. And the ponds is a different story to the rest of the the rest of the place and it's very patchy like where you get little patches of I say there, there are seedlings but they're generally those little patches below you know where trees have established and there's litter built up yeah anybody else Go on. Go on. thank you Catherine.